Is this coconut mold? Okay, so I played Silent Hill for the first time very recently. I know, I know, took me long enough. And since finishing it, I've obviously been completely obsessed with it. The claustrophobic town has swallowed me whole and is keeping me hostage in my own brain. The visuals are prickly and disgusting and I love it. The music is like nothing I've ever heard before. And I like some pretty insane music. <laughs> The oppressive, forceful nature of the game is almost too much. Since finishing it, I've watched a whole bunch of great analysis videos, like those by Josh Strife Plays and The Gaming Brit Show, especially useful for explaining the insane plot to me as well, thank you. And everyone seems to agree that the game is a PS1 masterclass in atmospheric, survival, claustrophobic horror. However, one thing is pretty clear. Everyone really f hates the voice acting. And let's be honest, no f wonder. It's slow, often unemotive, and no offense, I don't give a single shitting f about that dumb f Cheryl. So can we stop going on about her, please? Honestly, though, the more I keep thinking about the game, the more I feel like these weird conversations add a real stilted, off kilter nature to the game. I wanted to explore why these dialogue scenes are actually kind of great, how they slot into the rest of the game, and how they reinforce the atmosphere that the rest of the game is already instilling in us. So, let's take a walk out into the fog, shall we? First things first, I genuinely don't think that the voice acting, as in the actual recorded audio from the actors, is that bad. Are you sure? In fact, dare I say I really enjoyed it? I just don't get it. Most of the characters sound pretty distinctive to me. Sybil, Lisa, and Dahlia all sound great in my opinion. Like, Sybil and Lisa are definitely giving me a bit of 90s voice acting character, sure, but I just really love how they sound. I went after her, but she vanished. I don't know about your daughter, but I must have gotten knocked out. When I came to, everyone was gone. Yeah, probably because they didn't want to hang around with you anymore. Dahlia's voice actor really gave a performance, though. Yes, Dahlia Gillespie. Nailing that culty, mysterious woman with ease. This is beyond my abilities. Only you can stop it now. She's struggling to get that key. Her bones are like dust at this point. And okay, yeah, Harry's kind of boring, but um, I guess he is the straightest man alive, so. Comparing the dialogue and voice acting to some of the early Resident Evil games, for example, I think personally makes it clear who has the upper hand. Don't open that door! Like, Resi 2, babe, you're one of my most favourite nostalgic games, but um, I'd be lying if I didn't say you were one of the campiest games out there. <laughs> The voice acting is completely overdramatic. Ada! And while it ain't gonna be winning any video game BAFTAs for voice acting anytime soon, it is of course completely perfect. And it makes sense, Resi is a series that involves sci-fi bad guys, monstrous body transformations, exploding zombie headshots, and blood splattering across the screen. Silent Hill definitely takes a more serious approach, dropping the over-the-topness and silliness, mostly. I met this bizarre woman. Must be on drugs. What is this? <laughs> Okay, okay, of course, Silent Hill has its share of batch crazy monsters and unrealistic puzzles. Like, why, why is there horoscopes in this game? But I absolutely think going for a more nuanced style did the game massive favours for maintaining its more mysterious atmosphere, rather than the in-your-face maximalist obviousness that Rizzy goes for. Instead of leaving conversations thinking, wow, that sounds dumb, sometimes we are left with a chill, not really knowing what that last interaction was really about. Let's take a look at the cutscene when Harry first meets Sybil Bennett. Harry's just been through a weird scenario where he is chasing off after Cheryl, the world shifts into darkness and rust, he finds a tied up rotting mutilated corpse and gets overwhelmed by these small cloaked figures as they surround him and slash him apart. In an FMV, he suddenly wakes up in a diner, out of the nightmare and back into reality, or so we assume. The FMV is still kind of weird though, no one says a word, Harry's still in this shocked position as a female police officer walks closer to look at him, arms folded, and an almost knowing smile creeping across her face. We can only hear her footsteps and the creaking of her leather gloves.
We then enter into the first in-game cutscene showing a conversation between two characters. The most immediately noticeable thing is the unusually long pauses between the characters' voice lines, presumably as audio files are loaded in from the disc. Was I dreaming? How do you feel? Honestly, I f***ing love these pauses. The whole conversation takes on an eerie, unnatural tone, one that fills the player with a sense of unease. Who is this person we're talking to? Is she to be trusted? They don't know each other, and wouldn't you be a bit reserved talking to a uniformed stranger just after you had a vision of being stabbed to death by weird creatures, after you had a car crash and just lost your daughter that dragged you to this dumb town in the first place? Sybil almost sounds like a therapist, with a tone that is not quite accusatory, but with a vague air of authority. Why don't you tell me what happened? She does have more information than Harry does at this time. She knows about the town and the local area, and being a police officer can defend herself, but she too is in the dark on what is going on, so her apparent calmness of the whole situation is rather unsettling. The music in the background during this scene is also brilliant. It's not an out and out creepy or scary piece, but it's not a reassuring one either. The alien, sweeping synths, muffled organ, and plunking guitar carry the characters through this surreal conversation. Coupled with the pauses in speech, it makes the player think, is this reality, or is this still some kind of dream state? A question the player will constantly ask themselves throughout their entire time in Silent Hill. The persistent uneasiness of the conversation is abruptly cut off when Sybil leaves the cafe and Harry is left alone once more. No dialogue, no music, just the sound of his footsteps and his thoughts. The safety of having another human being, no matter how unknown they are, is suddenly gone, and he's left to face Silent Hill on his own. This conversational style is present all throughout the game, sometimes working to the game's advantage, and sometimes feeling <laughs> completely out of place, I will admit. A seven-year-old girl. What, she's your daughter? Yes. For example, when Harry walks in on Kaufman pointing a gun at him, the pacing and urgency just isn't there. It takes 12 seconds for him to lower his gun and respond, and that's even after he already tries to shoot poor Harry. Thank God, another human being. On the other hand, Harry's conversation with Dahlia Gillespie is as mysterious and intriguing as his chat with Sybil. I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. She's not got any shoes on. With this conversation, I didn't really feel any fear. Instead, I found myself feeling humorously perplexed due to the combination of the spiritual music, the relative safeness of the church from the monsters outside, Dahlia's dramatic tone, and the absolute gobbledygook coming from her mouth. And counteract the wrath of the underworld. Face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> like, oh, it's just some folky pagan witchy old woman who likes a bit of incense if you know what I mean. Of course, turns out she was a horrible mother who tried to sacrifice her daughter to birth a satanic god into the world that ended up f***ing incinerating her to death. Take that, you evil bitch! A few scenes prior to the final boss, the ghostly vision of Dahlia trying to drag her daughter along to be used in the ceremony is truly heartbreaking. I just want you to lend me a teeny bit of your power, that's all. No! I don't want to do it! As Dahlia rabbits on about the ritual, her daughter pleads for her to stop and that she just wants to be happy with her mother. For a brief moment, it seems like Dahlia understands and gives in to her daughter's wish. Oh yes, I see. Maybe mummy has been wrong. Before you realise, no. Herein lies the mother's womb, containing the power to create life. I could have done it all myself! Mommy? I don't think this scene would feel as captivating and horrifying if it wasn't for the pauses. I feel similarly about the final conversation with Lisa, as she is so clearly overcome with emotion. Stay by me, Harry. Please. I'm so scared. Help me. 
The stiff movement the game allows her as she stumbles over towards him doesn't do her any favours at appearing more human though. I mean, she's either like drugged or possessed or whatever, right? And he understandably freaks out. That scene is equal parts powerful, repulsive and emotionally confused and I think that atypical staging works all the better for it. Beyond just the dialogue, Silent Hill has a really effective sound design. A lot of the quote unquote music is gritty, grinding and industrial. Mm, we're not into that sound. And during my first playthrough, I found it hard to tell sometimes what was music and what was sound effects, adding to Harry's already heightened level of delirium. Whoever did the music for this game, wow, they knew what they were doing. The use of the radio staticky ringing noise as a monster detection device is beautiful design, and it's introduced in a near perfect way. After Sybil leaves in the diner scene, Harry is left all alone. The silence after the music is deafening, reinforcing Harry's sense of loneliness. I hate this game, I literally don't want to leave this cafe. Okay, we're doing it. As he heads to leave, a battery-powered radio kicks in, spitting out a ringing static, and soon after, a fleshy Zubat from hell smashes through the diner windows to feast on today's special, you. Initially, I didn't put two and two together that the radio indicates the presence of unworldly monsters, but soon enough, it became a great tool for combating Silent Hill's primary goal, getting from A to B without dying. The heavy fog and poor draw distance makes it a necessary mechanic in the game for not being completely mauled to death, and the way it stops working in the nowhere portion of the game is a great subversion of your normal survival tactics. I was recently in the US for a conference, and I decided to visit New York at the end. After having spent a week around a whole bunch of new people, I inevitably got a cold and didn't really feel like exploring around the city in the evenings by myself. One night, I found this little independent cinema, and they were showing this 2006 three-hour monster of a film, David Lynch's Inland Empire. Now, it's no secret that some of the devs and creative team were inspired by David Lynch, with Twin Peaks being a major obvious influence on the game. However, personally I'm strongly drawn to comparing the game to this film that came out seven years after the release of Silent Hill. Subtitled A Woman in Trouble, the film casts Laura Dern as she fantastically plays a Hollywood actress navigating a role in a supposedly cursed script as reality breaks down around her. The film is extremely surreal and experimental, the plot not so much winding as it does spiral, morph and fade from existence completely at times. Usually these kind of films are not for me, but there was something about it that was so mesmerising and captivating that it's been stuck in my mind ever since, and playing Silent Hill has brought it back to the forefront of my mind. Sparse, dragging conversations feature a lot in David Lynch's work, Inland Empire being no exception. One of the first conversations in the film occurs between Laura Dern's character, Nikki, and a neighbour known only as Visitor Number One. You know almost straight away that something is off. Upon the neighbour entering the house, our first shot of their conversation is filmed from the other side of the room. Their faces, and therefore their facial expressions, and to an extent their emotions, are obscured from the viewer, with Nikki facing away and the neighbour silhouetted from the light coming through the front door. Lynch also used digital home video recorders for filming this, meaning a lot of the shots have that pixely haze from the early noughties, leaving zoomed out shots a little unclear. The framing is not dissimilar to that of the scene in the diner, where the characters are eerily far apart, with not enough graphical capability to see lips moving during speech. The pixely nature of early games leaves a lot of emotional intent up to interpretation from the player. As Nikki and the visitor move to sit down, their conversation really takes on those uncomfortable pauses as Lynch switches between shots for each line. I think that it is important to know one's neighbours, to say hello to them. Yes, it's very rare these days, but that's very nice. Which house are you living in? Just down the way. The neighbour starts to break typical social etiquette during the conversation, and you can feel the tension thick in the air, helped out by the low, deep synth just barely audible in the background. No, I think you are wrong about that. No. Brutal fucking murder. 
Even as their conversation takes on a sinister tone, and Nikki suggests the visitor should leave, the characters don't change their movement or positions, their dialogue doesn't become any more fast-paced, or the pause is reduced. Their emotions and responses seem decoupled from what they are saying. Uh, I don't like this kind of talk. The things you've been saying, I think you should go now. Likewise, in Silent Hill, the pauses occur no matter the urgency or emotional content. Their conversation brilliantly ends with a surreal cut. After weaving an unfathomable tale, the neighbour points to a sofa, suggesting Nikki will be sitting there tomorrow, and as the camera looks at Nikki looking at the sofa, we cut to tomorrow, where surely enough, Nikki sits. However, as she receives the ordinarily positive news that she's got the part in the film she auditioned for, the music buzzes and booms louder yet. Perhaps this is not good news for Nikki after all. Both Inland Empire and Silent Hill feature scenes that are bizarre, grotesque, shocking, snappy, and out of this world. Where Silent Hill has flickering TVs, giant worms, and strung up rotting corpses, Inland Empire has anthropomorphic rabbits, horrifying superimposed faces, and screwdrivers sticking out of stomachs. Both also share the presence of deserved jump scares. Silent Hill's fake out of a scare matches Inland Empire's Nikki running towards the camera, a jump scare that Lynch literally walks to the camera, and it still gets the viewer jumping in their seats. More significantly, both pieces of work share alternative universes or corrupted worlds. Harry keeps finding himself slipping into the twisted projections of a lesser, where everything is familiar but different, with rusted chain-link fences, massive holes in the floor, extra floors appearing in the lift, and monsters whose only goal is to stop Harry. Initially, he has to walk through underground tunnels to reach the corrupted world, but soon enough, it is is pervasive enough to transform before his very eyes. Nikki instead finds herself stepping through a doorway marked Axon N, leading her to the film set, but from a few days or weeks in the past, where she can see her past self with the rest of the cast and creative team, causing a disturbance she observed days before. She escapes from the cast through a doorway in the film set, and instantly finds herself inhabiting the incongruous and transient world of her character. Now, dreamlike alternate worlds are no stranger to the medium of film, but there's something about these two that feels so similar to me. I think because both Harry and Nikki both kind of just stumble into them, they're not explained to either us or the characters, and our protagonists are just forced to accept it as their new reality, whether that be a split head lizard dog thing pacing around a mystical fire, snapping its vertical mouth at you, oh lovely, or a gaggle of women that start dancing to the locomotion by Little Eva. Okay, I guess this video did steer off from just the dialogue in the game, but really, I guess that's the whole point. All aspects interplay and intertwine so as to elevate the bizarreness and denseness of the world our protagonist finds himself in, whether that be the unnatural conversations, the foggy, impenetrable visuals, or the sound effects and music often blending together into a hazy ambience that makes everything it touches sticky and acidic. I honestly can't wait to get started with Silent Hill 2 and let the misty town envelop my mind once more. I streamed Silent Hill and a whole bunch of other 90s and noughties games on my Twitch channel and also here on YouTube at the same time, so feel free to subscribe here or follow me there to catch me in the future. I'll almost certainly play some more horror games like Silent Hill or Resi. I also have a Patreon if you wanted to help support the channel, and in the £3 tier you can receive a gift for free after three months, and a Discord server where we love to chat shit about old games like this. In the meantime, thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye! You'll single-handedly destroying the NHS. Anyone else here think they deserve a pay rise? We want more money. Not today. Not today, sister! That's quite rude, actually.